This original WSRE presentation is made possible by viewers like you. Thank you. She is Chief Medical Officer for Network Operations in Florida and a Pediatric Cardiologist for Nemours, Dr. Mary Mehta on this edition of Conversations. Dr. Mary Mehta's view of pediatric medicine is from both an operational and clinical perspective. As part of Nemours Children's Health System, Dr. Mehta serves as Chief Medical Officer for Network Operations for the State of Florida, as well as Chief Medical Officer for Pensacola. In addition, she is a practicing pediatric cardiologist. She received her MD from the University of Texas, did residency at Tulane University Medical Center in New Orleans, and completed her pediatric cardiology fellowship at the University of Miami Jackson Memorial Hospital. Prior to joining Nemours, Dr. Mehta held a variety of positions at South Florida Medical Facilities. We are pleased to have Dr. Mary Mehta on this edition of Conversations. Thank you so very much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Let me begin with asking you to tell me what exactly is Nemours? Nemours is a children's health system that covers over four states, uh, Florida and the Delaware Valley. Um, it was founded on a, the bequest of Alfred I. DuPont on his death to take care of the children. And um, we are the benefactor of that. And so his duty was to do whatever you could to relieve suffering, in, especially in children. And so it's what started as an orthopedic hospital because at the time in the 40s, orthopedics was all that they thought was curable. Mm -hmm. And so that it became that orthopedic hospital. And to this day, Demors is really known internationally for their orthopedic services. And, but with the founding of the hospital, it really expanded to all of the other services that were emerging and developing as specialty care for pediatrics, just like the adult world was going. But this is specifically for children. And because A.I. DuPont had his winter home in Florida and he made his second fortune in the state of Florida, um, that's what we have uh, the luxury of having this um, great uh, amount of money that is allowed to help us uh, thrive within uh, Florida to take care of children. And how many facilities are there in the state of Florida? Currently there are three. We have uh, one in Jacksonville, one in Pensacola, and we have our third facility is in uh, Orlando and that has the newest hospital. So we're the only children's health system that has two freestanding children's hospital in its system, one in Delaware and one in Orlando. Does each location specialize in a particular area or is it very widespread, diversified? All of the sites actually do have orthopedics and it is variable. Um, most have most of the medical subspecialty services and a variable amount of the surg pediatric surgical subspecialty. But at the Children's Hospital in Orlando, they do have all of the services there and still growing. Now your specialty is pediatric cardiology. Correct. How did you become interested in that? Well, when I was in um, residency, um, I actually started out a year in family practice and after about uh, four months into it, it was my special, my continuity clinic was almost all peds and that's where I was really loving it. But I didn't think I would really want to do a general pediatrics. As I went further into my residency, it, it just gravitated to cardiology. I like the three-dimensional aspect of figuring out what the heart is, um, what we could do to fix it, and um, it, it just really thrived. The technology that allowed us to diagnose these things, to do echo and then make the diagnosis and then be able to do something about it was just very challenging to me. And then I went on and did extra work of the prenatal diagnosis so we can really help the family prepare for what their child um, has uh, wrong with their heart, what we can do for it, and, and what the lifestyle changes may be because of that. So how early on can you tell there may be a problem? Well, normally we do it about 18 weeks. There are some places that can do earlier, even earlier diagnosis um, with a special technique of, of using intravaginal ultrasound, but it's normally considered at about 18 to 22 weeks is the best time to get the best pictures to make an accurate diagnosis. So at 18 weeks in the pregnancy, correct? then you can start spotting a potential problem. Oh, absolutely, absolutely down to all, not maybe completely, depending on the way the fetus is laying mm -hmm. or the mom's body size and all, but we can really get down to almost the exact diagnosis of what will, will be and what they need to plan for. Because the heart's already formed by 10 to 12 weeks. So. 10 to 12 weeks the heart's already mm -hmm. formed. 
That is, but that's absolutely phenomenal. For yeah. the layperson, that's just yeah. A, a, yeah. amazing to, right. to leave. So if you determine there is a problem, mm -hmm. um, what do you do at that point? That the main thing is, is really to educate the family of what this means um, because the hearts aren't going to continue to grow since the the baby's um, heart it really at that point since mom is doing all the breathing it didn't really care about that as long as blood's being distributed around for developing in the majority of the cases perfectly happy still growing most babies uh, cardiac babies are born at term big babies they just look blue because it's usually the instant of not getting the route amount of blood flow to the lungs once separated from mom. So we help them prepare and understand the diagnosis, what will need to be done, if anything, right at birth, or if we just need to manage the baby, and then um, some surgery would be needed later in life, sometimes, sometimes by six months, sometimes even later than that. So you say they're, except for the fact they're blue, so, so sometimes. This, <laughs> sometimes, sometimes, so what happens when the baby is born, if, if, if that's the case? We can use medicines to keep those fetal structures open or help, um, you know, uh, change the ventilator settings to help them stabilize as if something needs to be done immediately. And I said they're, that's, they're blue, not all of them are, sometimes they have too much blood flow to their lungs and then we have to manage it a different way. So it is a combination of too much blood, just enough blood, but the heart's sort of reconfigured wrong or um, not enough blood. And how long has this technology been available that you could... Well, I learned how to do it when I was doing my fellowship and I finished in 1994, so okay. I've been doing this for a while. Yeah. And obviously the technology gets better, the images, every time a new echo machine comes out and a new, it's like, wow, we can see that really well now. Right. Right. And the technique that I use is that I'm in there when the um, ultrasound is being done and I teach the family of what we're seeing so they can either struggle to say, okay, we're not seeing the baby and they understand that, or I can point out what the differences are on the screen using those examples for their own child. Now, sometimes we have to stop, obviously, because of the, the shock of that. Um, and then, but that really helps that continuity because they recognize of what's different after we do the education of saying, well, it didn't look like that last time we were here and they can see those differences. So really helping the parents see the technology, maybe not understanding it as completely as we do, but seeing those examples really makes a difference in their education of learning so they can tell the next person that's taking care of them or their pediatrician, no, this is what's wrong with my child's heart. What is the most common problem uh, with pediatric heart issues? The most common is some type of hole. Um, in the heart, the, between the two pumping chambers, between the upper chambers of the heart. Um, that is the most common. And I have a warped perspective because that's all I do is, is pediatric heart. But those are the most common um, defects. And later in life, is there anything that can be done to fix that? Oh, uh, yes, okay. definitely. Um, uh, pediatric open heart surgery is done uh, very commonly at multiple centers around the, the country with very, very good statistics. Um, and we try to match those, what the outcomes of the surgeon that is doing it with what the lesions is. We're able to talk to those, um, to the family over that period of time, the remaining part of their pregnancy, to help them determine what is the best place for delivery for them, mm -hmm. as well as what the surgical um, center needs to be when it's time for them to have surgery, if that's necessary. Maybe it's only a cardiac cath that needs to be done. Maybe they don't need um, surgery. And all of those things can be uh, help planned. And so they get an idea of the timing. It's not just about having the baby and then I don't know what happens. It's I know exactly, well, in the first 24 hours, this is what's going to happen in the first week or the first month. Um, those kind of things. It really helps them bring closure to what they need to do and what they understand is about to happen uh, for them and help them prepare. So it's a very real possibility a child lives very much a normal life. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Wow. The majority. Now, there are some that sure. we still to this day are, don't have the best outcomes for, but we're constantly working with the surgeons and the uh, further technology to help develop those things. But the majority of time, we can give them um, the right matching of the surgical technique or catheter technique that will help them live a you know, very normal life. And... Sometimes the families come back and say, you know, if, especially if they've seen how their 
child may be breathing too fast or getting tired after the surgery, it's like, uh, can we go back? Because they're like going crazy now. <laughs> That's exactly what they're going to do. They're going to be a normal child oh, okay. and they're going to run and play and do all of those uh, things in the majority of cases. Yeah. Are there issues, are there many issues, I should say, that develop um, as a child gets older, say four or five, teenager, is that common as far as uh, there cardiac are some events? Um, there are some things that don't are not picked up structurally mm -hmm. in the newborn period that can come up later. Um, one of the most common thing is Kawasaki disease, which is something unfortunately we don't know exactly what causes it, but it's an inflammation of the medium-sized um, arteries, and one of those are the coronary arteries, so they can get dilatation. Um, and that's manifest by uh, unexplained fever, red eyes, chapped lips. It just sort of goes on for 10 days. But we have a very good treatment for that to prevent it. So it's really about early recognition mm -hmm. of those kind of symptoms. Pediatricians all over know very well to always be looking for that in a high fever. So that's one thing. Um, it used to be a lot of rheumatic fever from mm -hmm. strep, untreated strep. That's really gone by the wayside a, a lot, but we still see that occasionally, especially in the state of Florida because people come in from the Caribbean where it's maybe not ag as aggressively treated. Um, and there are some genetic conditions um, that really don't manifest in the younger um, children and then start showing up in elementary school or in high school, depending on how much um, athletic endeavor you may do, or maybe nothing. Um, triggered by some other kind of symptoms like maybe the onset of diabetes might cause the effect, ill effects in the heart. It usually happens more in the teenage years, but we can certainly see it in younger children um, from multiple th other uh, systemic diseases. Yeah. Are, you know, we talk about older folks always mm -hmm. getting, you know, physicals and getting their heart mm -hmm. checked and cholesterol and all that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. Should children be doing that? Because you hear these outlying stories about the athlete who was the football player or mm -hmm. the track star and just out of left field something happens and mm -hmm. it was related back to their heart. Mm -hmm. Is that something that uh, parents should do for their children or is that... Well, you know, it's interesting because there is a lot of controversy in both the American Heart Association and the American Car Car uh, College of Cardiology about that and the pre-screening. Um, obviously, from a pediatrician standpoint, having a medical home, that pediatrician that constantly is um, evaluating the child over a period of time. Unfortunately, when kids sort of get out of those, I got all my shots, I got into school, we don't often keep up with those annual visits. Uh, it's been the finding. Um, but the real recommendation it for screening for that is a g very good history and family history of other early cardiac death, sudden deaths that are unexplained, like really good drivers that had an unexplained car accident, a good swimmer that drowned. Those kind of things is what should trigger more in the history standpoint to pursue further cardiac workup. It's not currently recommended to get an EKG. It's not currently recommended to get an echo. It's what's that history and symptoms. Now, unfortunately, you have both sides. You have the child that doesn't want to tell you. That, I mean, we're talking about teenagers. They don't always talk to us like we would like for them to. And we have the parents that see uh, a child that has, is a very good athlete and may discount some of the symptoms the child is trying to tell you. Um, they got to work with their coaches. They've got to work with their friends and, and other adult colleagues to help really say, okay, this is really not normal and we need to get further workup. That's what gives us the satisfaction when we can diagnose those things with good symptoms that we know we need to push to really get the workup done. I know one of the things that you, your organization, Demores, mm -hmm. has been doing is working with, speaking of athletics, uh -huh. or working with Andrews Institute. Correct. And what, what's that all about? Well, um, we have had a relationship really with Andrews more from an educational or if they had a child that had a special kind of injury because we have three pediatric orthopedists here in Pensacola that specialize in scoliosis, joint replacement for children and those. So as we begin to talk about their resources, because they get called from all over the the country that we do have this ability to take care of those children's here. Um, we talked a little bit about their screening program and um, they what ha had happened years ago when they first established this is that there was an event just like that in the city and everybody volunteered that they were doing and then they sort of realized as it got really big 
that they were having the adult cardiologist reading ninth and 10th year olds, which that's not necessarily the best way to do it. That's not what they do every day. So we partnered with what the, the best uh, recommendations were from the academies um, to do. And so that's what we started this first this year of partnering with all the screenings that they do. And they have such a fabulous program of their athletic uh, trainers in the schools identifying. They know the situation of the home can really get to those symptoms that are really um, making sure those forms are filled out correctly that really helped trigger us of this kid needs an extra um, cardiac clearance and that was very successful this past week. And, and, and you mentioned sometimes that uh, a person who, or a, a physician that works with adults might be looking at the at the kid. How much difference is it working with adults versus children? Is it a different it's, world? It is. It's a completely different world. Um, we as peds cardiologists we are constantly um, thinking about, well, are all four chambers there, or what do we do if there's a chamber missing or there's a vessel missing? That's sort of our world of thinking. The other th interesting thing about EKGs, a pediatric cardiologist won't read an EKG unless we know the age of a child, because just putting an EKG in front of me, it's not the normal standards for a six-month-old versus a 12-year-old, completely normal. And a lot of times in that early growth, it changes almost every six months. There would be different standards. So those simple things, whereas adult cardiologists, they're generally thinking about their 40 to 65-year-old adult um, looking to see whether it's male or female to what the, the things, but they're not really, in my opinion, looking at is this a six month old I'm reading for or a 70 year old. That's a big difference of what you would consider standards. Um, and so those kind of details of exactly what the age of the child and looking for that possible structural heart lesion is what really triggers the difference in children versus adult. Assuming everything is okay and young person's rolling along, no, no issues, at, at what stage in the game should you really start thinking about heart health? Because, you know, I know I'm at the stage now that, you know, I say, well, maybe I shouldn't have that fried food or, you know, mm -hmm. uh, so how early is too early or, or is it's, there such a thing? It's not too early at everything. And it, it's really difficult sometimes when we start um, seeing a child that might be either not as active or becoming overweight and trying to talk about the foods that are in their house. They may have a very simple, um, most common uh, congenital defect in, in everything is a bicuspid aortic valve. And that was diagnosed by, um, unfortunately, the autopsies they did in, in World War. And that was the most common thing, very common which is usually very well tolerated. I mean, it's, many people can be in the military with that and other things. But if you partner that with smoking, um, alcohol usage, abusage, and as well as a very fatty diet, completely change what the valve would look like over time and can progress that um, easily simple congenital defect into something that could become aortic stenosis because the leaflet's getting very thickened. So every time is a chance for us to talk to a child and the parent about making sure that they keep good um, heart health um, to do. So much easier said than done. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. Ch child or adult, right? Child and adult, right. <laughs> that's right. And, you know, just mentioning that, that's very odd. When we can send a child to get pediatric dietary counseling, of course, you think the family comes with them, mm -hmm. but they learn a lot of stuff in the, the part of um, for their own heart health, too, because they're in there with their child and thinking about what they're sitting in their cabinet, that it's really easy to just go grab potato chips as opposed to the apple or banana that's sitting on the on the counter. Well, in adults, um, I think I'm pretty close to being right on this. Heart disease is one of the leading killers, yeah. in, but also perhaps one of the most preventative, is that? Well, um, that's what we would think, is that if we keep uh, and improve our diet, cut down on some of the other risk factors like smoking, and um, alcohol abuse, um, then we would have a better heart, heart healthy. And exercise is a big thing, which is also another thing with the um, getting the clearances done very quickly for the kids. There's such a tight schedule for the coaches in the summer, what they need to get an athlete. And so if we can get them in and keep them exercising, as opposed to thinking, well, I just gave up that whole sports season, and then somehow they think that they can't do it 
then they suddenly stop exercising altogether. So mm -hmm. our whole goal is to get them out there. May, they may not be the football star or the basketball star, but keep them exercising, learning to exercise early and not thinking that a diagnosis of a heart murmur, which is very common in children, that doesn't keep you from exercising. Right. So let's get those clearances and get the kids back being active. Interesting, very interesting. In your career, where have you seen the most advances as far as heart um, is concerned, as far as cardiology is concerned? Oh, I definitely think of the prenatal diagnoses of knowing ahead of time of what the congenital heart defect and in the surgical uh, repair of those. Um, there used to be, um, you know, a, a diagnosis that used to be the most lethal was hypoplastic left heart. The left ventricle, the main pumping chamber out to the body, didn't form. Mm -hmm. And those kids uniformly would die. Those infants would die. And so over the years, as Dr. Norwood um, developed the Norwood procedure to help reroute the blood to do that, the success rate has just gone just incredibly. And so the majority of kids born with that in the right center would have between a 95 and 98 percent chance of surviving um, through their three stage of operations. So it's, it's, that has been the most incredible because when I first started training they really had you know an option of not do any intervention absolute would um, not survive versus now can either go to transplant depending on the anatomy or the uh, Norwood procedure with very good success. As you look out on the horizon from a technological standpoint what are you most excited about in medicine and particularly in, in, in cardiology. I, I really think, um, like we talked about a little earlier, of the 3D printing to be able those very complex lesions to um, to really be able to touch it and, and feel it outside in like the 3D printer or, or the model of the heart that the surgeon can use to really be able to plan their surgical technique as opposed to looking at a flat screen ultrasound and visualizing in their head. We all sort of do that when we go to read an echo, but to actually look at it and, right. and decide where those sutures are going to be, where I'm going to cut, where do I put the baby on the pump to have the best uh, visualization of what I, operation I need to do, because once you go on the pump, you got to do it quickly. And so that planning is the whole team's planning of what they need to do is critical to improving the success of children mm -hmm. with heart disease. And, and, and from a 3D printing standpoint, you're just able to basically take a photograph of the heart and then the, it prints it out? From the computer regeneration of all of the echo pictures, slices that we did, and be able to, to regenerate that, yeah. So we hear things an awful lot about like artificial hearts and, or, and, and, and the transplants. So mm -hmm. where, where are we in, in that stage these days? Oh, well, we're really advancing on that because especially when you need to have a baby transported to um, a center that may be specialized in only one kind of thing, sometimes they have to be transported on support. Um, and that would mean uh, ECMO support, uh, meaning the heart is not functioning well, so we have to put them on the heart-lung machine out. We have transport size versions for babies. They have Berlin hearts to support heart failure or waiting for a transplant. Um, that they can do up outside, the, the pump outside um, the heart, and they sort of carry their own little cart with their heart uh, down to help supporting and waiting for that. So mm -hmm. it's um, miniaturizing the, the big bulkier uh, support that you could use in a heart, uh, I mean an adult patient is the biggest challenge, getting that continued support, mechanical support to move it through in a child size version or an infant sized version right. kind of thing. So technology is just changing on a, on a daily um, basis. Oh, for and the I, sometimes I don't feel like I can keep up, you know, of yeah. doing all the things I'm running to try to read or listen to the lectures all the time. Um, you really need that team approach. It's like, hey, I read this article. Did you hear about, no, I didn't see that yet to keep up. If you were advising someone who was looking for a career, so a college student, uh -huh. What area of medicine would you suggest they go into? Oh, I think I would just say where your passion is, you know, kind of thing. Because it is, the, the pediatric field is a completely different kind of concept, uh, really. It's, I have so many people, all the, I don't see how you do this. But, but I feel like I'm just helping children. But other people says, oh, no, no, that's too close to home. That's, I have kids, I can't do that, you know, kind of thing. And it's really finding that part of that 
that connection to helping people, I think, is how you pick it. Yeah. It's not about money. <laughs> it's not about, you know, oh, I love, you know, dermatology kind of thing. It's really what your passion is yeah. to help people. What you're calling. Yes, exactly. Nemours works an awful lot, as I understand it, with medical students and mm -hmm. nurses and doctors. And Tell oh, me yeah. about that program. Well, we have um, residents that rotate through as well as medical students. They come from FSU and University of Florida currently uh, rotate through our subspecialty uh, clinics to learn and really help encourage them. Do you want to do general peds or this is what we do in our life to get exposure to to go on and further their training. Um, nursing students we have, we work through Pensacola State College, we, UWF, um, Pensacola uh, Christian come and rotate through and nurses and peds, they, it's really a very special thing that they have to be able to work in a clinic for peds because most nursing programs really have to do the their time in the adult world because there's more before you get a chance to move into pediatrics. But here, they're really able to get some exposure to pediatric care very uh, early in their education to help make their decision. Mm -hmm. We have social workers, uh, pediatric social workers, that we have um, interns from UWF that are able to come and see what it's like and some of the challenges of the pediatric patients and their family, especially in the new diagnosis of oncology, um, making that um, you know, just being told your child has cancer and what mm -hmm. that means is a huge extra support you need just besides the doctor and the nurse relationship with the family. Yeah. In about one minute, what are you most excited about? Um, growing the subspecialty uh, care that we have here in this part of the, um, the state of Florida because we are within, outside of Escambia and Santa Rosa count, County, we have a big rural but it is unheard of that we have this amount of pediatric subspecialists who love living here yeah. and the, the chance we have to expand those services because the majority of pediatric care is really done in an outpatient setting. Yes, we have to do higher level tertiary and quaternary care uh, in a hospital setting and surgical, but pediatric care is really about working with the families to help them get better and out playing and out working and be able to uh, ultimately have a good life with their family. What a fascinating conversation. Thank you for your time. Thank you. I enjoyed being here. Absolutely. We enjoyed having you. Learned a lot. <laughs> Good. <laughs> feel like I was in science class here. <laughs> oh, Dr. Mary Meta. she is the chief medical officer with Nemours in Pensacola, and she also plays a major role across the state with Nemours. By the way, you can learn more about Nemours Children's Specialty Care at Nemours.org. And you can see more of our conversations online at wsre.org slash conversations. We're also on Facebook and YouTube. And by the way, if there's a particular program you like, feel free to share it via social media. I'm Jeff Weeks. Thank you so very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the broadcast. Take great care of yourself. We'll see you soon. Support for this program is provided in part by these corporate sponsors. And by viewers like you.